Um, well, hindi natin yan question, but uh, since we are Filipinos, uh, even I myself support the Filipino side of the document. No, During that time, yung nagpista sila sa Virgin of Loreto, and then until such time na na-impose uli ni, ni Governor General Rafael de Izquierdo yung yung uh, tinatawag nating um, mandated economic policies so nagkahirapan na sila no na na maging frequent or shall i say um, embracing to the practices that they have during the time of uh, Carlos Maria de la Torres uh, general late now here comes the uh, cry of revolution, yung question naman dito, class, is kailan at saka saan unang nangyari ang sigaw ng himagsikan. But I tell you, um, hindi na lang natin isaalang-alang yun yun. Ano? Kasi maraming versions. No? Eh, Dr. Pio Valenzuela gave his version on the Pugad Lawin. And here comes um, Santiago Alvarez. No? Santiago Alvarez was not there, but nagsulat siya ng version niya ng, ng, ng cry. Ika nga yung sinasabi niya na uh, uh, sa bahay toro nangyayari lahat. And the wife of uh, Andres Bonifacio, in the person of Ka Oriang or um, Gregoria de Jesus, no, is uh, nagbigay din ng kanyang bersyon no, as the darling of the katipunan, nagbigay din ng kanyang bersyon ng unang sigaw ng himagsikan. And Guillermo Masangkay here huh, gave his August 26 of 1896 version on the cry of the Lintawa. Well, actually, there is another version class na nangyari daw talaga lahat sa bahay or sa asotea ng bahay ni Melchor Aquino, no? ang ina ng Katipunan or ni Tandang Sora. Doon, si, doon din pinunit ang sedula. No? If you can still remember the sedula yesterday for your readings, the cedula is this, the symbol of the um, enslavement of Spain to us. No? And pinunit nilang cedula at sumigaw ng ipaglaban ng kalayaan, mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Okay? Now this morning, our discussion will also have a connection in all of this. The February 17, 1872 event has a connection on what, why did the Filipinos fought or established for revolt. Okay? Kasi inusente ang tatlong paring martir na pinatay ng mga Kastila. And um, may connection nito kung bakit nag-alsa ang mga katipuneros at saka ang mga Filipino noong unang panahon. Andres Bonifacio uh, secretly established the KKK on uh, 1892. Okay, but it was revealed to the Spaniards in the year 1896. Kaya nag-alsa sila at saka may mga iba't ibang version tayo ngayon na tinatawag nating sigaw ng himagsikan. Now for this morning, I'll be discussing with you the first document that entails about the socio, ano, the political, economic, and let's add, spiritual aspect here in the Philippines. Ika nga yung panuntunan na bakit nga ba nag-alsa ang mga Pilipino and what was one of the main factors why Filipinos resisted against Spain. Now again, going back to the idea that for the last 500 years, we embraced our, um, we embraced Catholicism, we embraced the gift of faith na, that was planted to us, that was nourished nurtured to us during the time when Ferdinand Magellan has this encounter with the native uh, Visayans, no? itong mga ika nga for them, mga gentiles or mga gentiles. And on that very day, March 31, 1521, the first mass happened. No? It's in Limasawa, Leyte. At uh, bininyagan ang laang karamihan sa mga natives na ito and they embrace Catholicism during that time. And for that fight for that March 31, 1521, after Spain left the they had this notion um, maybe uh, magagamit natin ang ang bansang ito no for our glory. Yan yung sabi ng Espanya at saka ng hari nung unang panahon. So later on 
uh, when Spain was very much successful in establishing the colony in the Philippines through Miguel Lopez de Legazpi in 15, uh, 1563, one of the duties of Spain is actually to propagate the Catholic faith. Now take note, Spain's three main goal is the 3G, the God, the glory, and the gold. God, of course, this is from, in accord to what they um, what they been what they agreed with with the Pope not during the time that they have to spread Christianity and convert more people to Christianity. At naging um, isa yan sa mga naging duties at saka mission ng Spain noong unang panahon. And later on, meron tayong tinatawag na uh, the servants of God who nourished us with Catholicism, who nourished us with Christianity from time to time. So Spain, uh, Spain sent uh, this early five missionaries in the Philippines to help Spain in propagating the faith and baptizing a lot of people to submit to Christianity. So the first one who arrived in the Philippines was two years later, no? after 1563-1564. In the year 1565, dumating ang mga Augustinians from the order of St. Augustine okay? in 1565. Now in 1578, the order of St. Francis, or also known as the Franciscan Friars, arrived in the Philippines, 1578. The third one who arrived was in 1581. No? They are not uh, friars. They are not um, from a, a particular uh, fr a friar, Franciscan or Augustinian, but they are so-called the Jesuits, okay? yung mga Jesuita. Okay? They arrived in 1581 and they are very known to their apostolate in education. Alam naman natin that they are very famous and um, known as uh, owner of these prestigious schools here in the Philippines and even in abroad. No? Itong tinatawag nating Ateneo. Ateneo de Davao, Ateneo de Manila, Ateneo de Sabuanga, Xavier University, Cagayan, and even... Ateneo de Naga University. I'm not sure kung may Ateneo de Cebu ba class. But they're very famous and run one of these prestigious schools here in the Philippines. Now, the fourth one as well is they're very much particular into their educational apostolate who are friars from the order of the preachers or they are so-called as the Dominicans. They arrive in the Philippines in 1587 and as well establish schools here in the Philippines. But they are known to be the sole um, owner of the oldest Catholic university, not just here in the Philippines, but also in Asia. No? Itong tinatawag nating Dominicans or the Dominican, uh, uh, no, itong university na University of Santo Tomas that was established in the year 1611, huh? 1611. The fifth one who arrived in the Philippines the same year, 1587, were the Augustinian Recollects. No? Augustinian Recollects. Now seeing all of these priests, missionaries who arrived here in the Philippines, they helped Spain in propagating the Catholic faith. They taught a lot for the Filipinos. And by extension as well, they observe a lot from us Filipinos. Okay? If you can still remember the customs of the Tagalogs, no? ito yung sulat, narratives about the lifestyle, the customs of the, of the Filipinos before we were Hispanized fully by Spain. But in our document today, we will not be talking about how they developed so much or how they contributed so much here in the Philippines. Um, maybe I want to talk with you in a document na kung saan ay pinuna yung mga practices nila no, noong unang panahon. The document that I'm going to talk with you this morning is the so-called the Monastic Supremacy in the Philippines. The Monastic Supremacy in the Philippines, or also known in Spanish as La Soberania Monacal and Filipinas that was highlighted because we were ruled by the friars especially during in, in the uh, especially during the 18th and 
19th century. So bakit nga ba naging nasa kapangyarihan ang mga friars? Number one, because of this so-called patronato real. Now ladies and gentlemen, what is a patronato real? Patronato real means um, it is a royal patronage, no? a royal grant giving the, the kingdom of Spain the power to appoint religious priests no? religious priests as uh, administrators into local communities yes we have national government then we have local government during that time but isa sa mga naging basehan ng pamamalakad is yung pamamalakad ng mga frailes no unang panahon no? because they were given a power from the king of spain to to do such um, ruling or management in a particular local community. The second aspect here is that they serve God and then they serve the king. And the third one is yung tinatawag nating clerical ascendancy. No? Yung pagpapataas ng posisyon ng lahat ng mga frailes noong unang panahon. Now, the La Soberania Monacal in Filipinas is a document that highlights again the malpractices of the friars during the 18th and the 19th century. And the author of this document is Marcelo H. Del Pilar. He is known to be as one of our national heroes, a very a literary giant, and at the same time, he is one of the comrades of Dr. Jose Rizal in Spain. No? Yung tinatawag ng mga ilustrados or mga or nasa pa, nasa a grupo ng Circulo Hispano-Filipino. Now, Marcelo H. Del Pilar was a Philippine revolutionary propagandist because mostly his ideas are very revolutionary. And at the same time, he is a satirist because he is so fond of writing satirical themes of his writings, you know, more on abuses, more on scandals of the practices, particularly this document, you know, the monastic supremacy in the Philippines. Now, the background, he was born in Kupang, Bulacan, on August 30 of 1850 to cultured parents. He studied at the Colegio de San Jose you know, as one of his primer. <clears throat> and later, he finished his Bachelor's of Law in 1880 you know, sa University of Santo Tomas. And even Dr. Jose Rizal, Marcelo H. Del Pilar, during that time, already observe a lot of malpractices, discrimination ng mga praile at saka ng mga Kastila sa mga Filipinos. And with that, um, he was fueled by the sense of justice against the abuses of the clergy. Yung mga sulat niya ay um, base na sa kanyang mga observasyon no? laban sa mga Kastila. And aside from that, he is also... He was also defending a lot of people who were victims of racial discrimination. But alam naman natin na limited lang din yung practices ng mga Pilipino noong unang panahon kasi nga there's no equality before the law during that time. No? Kung, kung Indio ka, no? ito yung tawag sa mga Pilipino noong unang panahon, Indio. No? Ay, uh, um, wala kang lugar sa lipunan, ika nga, no? kung titingnan natin. And his mastery of the Tagalog, or itong tinatawag nating um, mastery of the Tagalog language, enabled him to arouse the consciousness of the masses, no? um, calling, inviting every Filipino to to unite and to have a sustained resistance against the Spanish tyrants. No? Ito yung sandalan. Now, in 1882, Marcelo H. Del Pilar founded the newspaper entitled the Diaryong Tagalog. No? And the aim of this uh, periodical was to propagate more democratic liberal ideas, especially to those who were victims of uh, abuses, particularly the farmers and the peasants. There was also a time in the year 1888 that he defended Dr. Jose Rizal. No? I'm not sure if uh, you are familiar with this pamphlet called Kaingat Kayo no? that was accused to Dr. Jose Rizal na, na nag-disseminate ng mga pamphlet that uh, uh, showcased or revealed the, the practices of the friars in the Philippines during that time. 
But again, um, hindi din uh, nakaligtas si Marcelo H. Del Pilar sa tinatawag nating clerical persecution. No? And just like Dr. Jose Rizal, they, he also exited the country for his family's safety. Okay? Now, in 1889, December of that year after 1888, he succeeded Graciano Lopez Haina as the editor-in-chief of the Filipino reformists. No? Naging, naging reformist ito si Laclas. No? Kasi gusto nila na ipahayag sa Espanya na sana ang Pilipinas ay maging provincia ng Spain and hindi lang isang kolonya. No? Kasi pag provincia ka, may kaukulan ng karapatan no yung mga Filipinos na maging shall I say citizens of Spain during that time and he began as the editor in chief of this so-called periodical La Solidaridad sa Spain now under Del Pilar gusto niya na mapalawak pa no the expansion of the aims of the newspaper aside from aside from the reformist view aside from the assimilationist view no? aside sa calling Filipinos to have freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, gusto ni, ni Marcelo H. Del Pilar yung removal of the friars and the secularization of the parishes. No? Kung malalala nyo yung gusto ng mga ng tatlong paring pinatay, no? si Gumbursa, na sana ay makapaghawak din sila or makapag-manage din sila ng kanilang parokya or simbahan. Now, um, naging malaya sila na sinulat ito ano? and mostly their audiences were Filipinos abroad as well and even Spaniards kasi nasa Spain lang ang La Solidaridad but amidst all of this um, yung tinatawag nating excitement nila that hopefully Spain will listen to them nagka problema din no ang La Solidaridad sometimes pera kasi nga wala nang pumapasok na support sa kanilang adhikain and the money, the paper was exhausted during that time and there still appeared no sign of any immediate response from the Spanish ruling class, particularly from the king na sana ay ma-accept sila as uh, uh, ang Pilipinas ma-accept no? ito yung tawag dating assimilation no? na maging uh, provincia ng Espanya at hindi lang kolonya but later on, when Ho Marcelo H. Del Pilar decided to begin a planned revolt, no? gusto na niyang, uh, to plan a revolt in the Philippines. No? Kasi parang ayaw na niyang maniwala sa assimilization na, na stand during that time at saka baka wala na talagang pag-asa. So he began to plan an armed revolt in the Philippines. No? Pero hindi nangyari yun kasi nga namatay siya ng tuberculosis sa Barcelona noong July 4 of 1896. Okay, namatay si um, Marcelo H. Del Pilar. No? Wala na si Rizal nito because Rizal was already um, uh, deported to the Pitan. No? If you can still remember your Rizal. Now, his most important work is this La Soberania Mon. Ah, sorry, class. Babalikan ko konti. Naging inspirasyon din yung sulat ni uh, Marcelo H. Del Pilar sa mga plano ni Andres Bonifacio no aside from aside from Noli Metangere, El Filibusterismo no? naging inspirasyon din ito ni Andres Bonifacio yung pagpapatakbo or pagpapataguyod niya ng katipunan movement and as we all know again that this important work of Marcelo H. Del Pilar denounced the friars wrong teaching in the Philippines Okay? Itong tinatawag nating monastic supremacy in the Philippines that resulted in a life of poverty and misery towards the Filipinas. And of course, class, just like Jose Rizal, para hindi sila mahuli noong unang panahon, ay they hide their real identity. At sinulat, ang sulat niya ay, pinuna, ay I'm sorry, uh, he wrote it under the pen name of Claridel. Okay. Now, this document is divided into three aspects. I'm not going to discuss all of the aspects, class, but it will be a summarized one since I will also be giving to you, sharing to you, the PDF document of, uh, PDF document of this uh, uh, doc, 
PDF document of this uh, discussion. Okay. Now, political aspect, economic aspect, and religious aspect. So let's start with the political aspect. Again, class, naging awayan din ng gobyerno noong unang panahon, yung pakikialam ng mga frailes sa panggobyerno aspeto. There's a lot of things, especially what happened to the status quo of Dr. Jose Rizal under Ramon Blanco and uh, Nozaleda during that time. Now, the friars control the status quo of the country because mas pinariringan pa nila ng hari, actually, yung report ng mga frailes noong unang panahon, especially if uh, shaken yung will ng Governor General during that time. Okay? May moderating power ang mga parish priests or yung mga frailes in every local community that they have. So that means to say, kahit mga municipal officials nakadepende sa mga parish priest noong unang panahon. Okay? And even yung mga tao ay takot sa mga praile. Kasi nga, laman ng salita nila is that we are also the voice of God. So you have to listen to us. Okay? So, <coughs> in the political aspect, kung titingnan natin, mas malaki ang, ang ruling ng mga frailes over the local officials noong unang panahon. Kahit nga yung aspeto ng votation, no? yung pagpipili ng mga alkadyas, ng mga ayuntamientos, or ng mga kabezas, no? mga kabeza de barangay, ay um, in control pa rin no? ang mga fraile noong unang panahon. But take note, ito yung tinatawag nating frailocracy class, no? frailocracy, na kung saan ang may hawak ng panggobyerno ay ang mga frailes. Now, under economic aspect, titingnan natin dito yung compare-contrast no, ng ginagawa ng government at saka ng monasteryo or ng mga frailes. Number one, the government lacks resources to undertake public works. Kasi nga, not all Filipinos can pay taxes during the time. But for the monastery, sa mga frailes, they build grand convents and spacious palaces wherein parang hindi sila na, nahihirapan no, sa pagpapatayo ng mga kumbento, ng mga palasyo nila noong unang panahon. And um, if the government tend to establish more primary schools in each town, pero problema nila ang mga teachers. But kasi mostly, during the time of the Spanish colonization, ang mga paaralan ay hawak ng mga frailes at saka ng mga beatas. So, sir, saan ang mga beata? Beata po ang tawag sa mga madre noong unang panahon. And that's still under the church. And friar curates has stable places in, in their primary schools no, noong unang panahon. Hindi nila kailangan ng support ng government to establish schools. Or kung support man lang, baka sa fundings na pagpapatayo, ayaw nilang gumastos ng sarili nilang pera. Now, if the government find thousands of obstacles from tax-paying public, di ba? kung maalala nyo kahapon yung mga types of taxes, yung uh, tributo, uh, donativo, caja de comunidad, no? Um, Di, di lahat ng mga Filipinos nakakapagbayad sa tax, ng tax. No? And they worry so much about meeting financial needs during that time. But for the monastery, para sa mga frailes, the public pay because of return for heavenly promises. And the church was overflowing with money. Okay? Overflowing with money ang simbahan ng unang panahon. The government refrains from creating new sources of revenue kasi nga ang main source lang naman nila is aside from encomienda system, aside from the tax, the taxes, no? imposition of the taxes, aside from the galleon trading, the tobacco monopoly, and even yung tax na falya no? sa mga polista, sa mga nagpo-forced labor system. If yun lang talaga yung main source of income. But the friars can form... That, I mean, can create new forms of devotion para magkapera lang sila. And dito sila abusive talaga. Ano? Kasi nga, 
um, ito yung aspeto na alam din nila aside sa pagiging uh, freelocratic. No? So titingnan natin itong um, religious aspect plus. Bakit abusive ang mga frailes nito? Number one, Um, when the Pope issued the, the tax of religious festivals no, that was issued on May 2, 1867, this was one of the directives that um, called to uh, relieve the Filipinos of the burden sa mga town fiestas nila noong unang panahon. Because I tell you, the church has been celebrating a lot of fiestas. And alam naman natin na pag-fiesta ay magastos, maraming babayarin. Uh, kung today, no, ang gastos ng actually is kanil magpakaon ka na, na, no, sa mga fiesta. But noong unang panahon, hindi babayaran nyo actually ang simbahan sa mga gamit nila noong unang panahon. Novena, masses, sermons, mga music na gagamitin, yung banda, yung mga kakanta yung mga gagamitin sa simbahan and even yung mga paputok no for the celebration of the fiestas the the the, the people have to pay for all of this kaya giridus ito ng santo papa pero hindi nga ito agad-agad nangyari it is because hawak tayo ng mga frailes eh wala naman ang santo papa dito sa Pilipinas noong unang panahon now aside from these costly festivals no ito yung tinatawag costly festivals um may mandate din na in every community of 50 families, dapat meron din silang mga chapel na nabubuo. Mga chapel na nabubuo. And one chapel, the uh, creation or construction of a chapel, will cost 1,000 pesos, 5, 10 to 15,000 pesos all and all. And napakagastos po nito, ladies and gentlemen. No? Kung titinan natin the side of the Filipinos noong unang panahon, hindi lahat ng Pilipino mayaman. Hindi lahat ng Pilipino ay mga nasa prinsipalya. Hindi lahat ng mga Pilipino mga sangli. Uh, majority sa mga Pilipino are mga Indio at saka India. Now aside from that, abuse din ang mga Pilipinos when it comes to the selling or paying of the miraculous objects or itong tinatawag nating mga um, itong mga um, sacramentals no itong mga religious objects no? binili na nga nila tapos for month pinabayaran pa nila ito ng tax no? karon makapalit ang grocery wala na may tax no ipabless na lang nato sa pare pero sa unang panahon paliton pa nila bayaran pa nila kada bulan and i tell you aside from that may tax din ang simbahan di ba sanctorum ang tawag ng tax ng inimpose na simbahan Aside from miraculous objects, costly festivals, construction of chapels, mer nagbabayad din ang mga Filipinos ng stipend. Although it has no fixed amount, it has no fixed amount, but it has no fixed amount, but kailangan nila ito in accordance, uh, I mean, binabayaran nila ang mga pare I mean, kinukuha niya yung fundings according to percentage ng mga sedula na nakokolek. No? So, um, naagihapoy uh, amount no? na kailangan nilang bayaran. No? Ala, kailangan nilang bayaran. And with that, napaka-abuse din plus is that the parish priest in a particular community has the power to monopolize everything, particularly when it comes to the census. No? Kasi nga, registered ang lahat ng mga tao noong unang panahon from the names, from the families, binyag actually, patay actually, kasal no? during that time. And naka, nakasensus yan. Dito malalaman ng mga pura paroko kung magkano yung nakukuha nila from the public. No? Yung treasury nila noong unang panahon. No? And talagang napakasakit na no? sa ito sa mga Filipinos kung titingnan natin a lot of Filipinos even suffer from their lands kasi nga ito mga tinatawag ding rentals no kailangan magbayad ng mga Filipino ng uh, rentals sa mga frailes kung hindi sila makabayad ng rentals uh, pwede silang paalisin sa lupain na tinitirhan nila and then is uh, susunugin yung mga bahay nila noong unang panahon no these were one of the setups of the Filipinos why 
um, a lot of Filipinos still suffers from misery and poverty during the time when uh, the friars were in a height and power. Kaya naging main source din ito. Aside from, aside from taxation, aside from the polo y servicio, no, or the forced labor system na na kinainisan at kinagalit ng mga Pilipino kaya merong pag-aalsa is ito ding mga practices ng mga frailes. A lot of Filipinos suffer from uh, suffer emotionally, physically, financially and of course Filip there are some Filipina or India were sexually abused, no? Kaya naging laman ito ng kontrobersya sa no limit ang at LP de Busterismo ni Rizal na nalaman ni Maria Clara na anak siya ng isang religyoso. Okay. So, uh, the document of uh, Marcelo H. del Pilar focuses or gives us the idea that the friars really maltreated the Filipinos. Yes, they are workers of the church, they are proclaimers of the gospel, pero hindi nila napatunayan noon sa mga Filipino kung Ano nga ba ang simbahan? What is a church that is a church for the poor? A charitable church? A church who is forgiving? But iniba nila ito no? sa kamamaraan na alam ng mga frailes noong unang panahon. And masakit ito, class. Ano? Masakit ito. Kasi nga, um, naging, naging laman ito ng... Uh, um, naging laman ito ng ng lahat no? even even the time when uh, uh, Filipinos were still yearning for for freedom and liberation pero masakit ito para sa mga sa kanila na naranasan nila under the Spanish friars or yung tinatawag nating frailocracia nga sa Pilipinas okay so that ends my presentation on the first document. Actually, second na siya class, no? Kasi yung first ay naibigay ko na as activity last time, no? Naibigay ko na as activity last time. Okay? So, are there any questions or clarifications?